Good evening. We are going to start. Um, we are extremely pleased to welcome you tonight to the United Nations uh, for a very, very special evening, a celebration of Oscar Niemeyer, who is turning 104 today. My name is Nathalie Leroy, and I represent the United Nations Academic Impact, a global partnerships between the United Nations and institutions of higher education, research, and culture, which was launched about a year ago, and uh, now our initiative counts 770 members in 110 countries. The idea for tonight's event came about as we were planning the educational program that accompanies the Design with the Other 90% Cities exhibition, which uh, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum has brought to the United Nations. And we are extremely grateful to Cooper Hewitt and the whole team for bringing this wonderful program, a rich uh, exhibition and uh, a fantastic educational program. This is the fifth in the series. Um, tonight, uh, we'll have a panel discussion, but before, uh, Cynthia Smith is going to introduce you a little bit to the exhibition, and we hope that you will go and see the exhibition. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. Uh, Cooper Hewitt is very pleased to partner with the UN Academic Impact Initiative and UN Habitat in presenting Design with the Other 90% Cities exhibition here at the United Nations. If you don't know us, Cooper Hewitt is the National Design Museum. We're part of the US's National De Museum System, the Smithsonian Institution. Cooper Hewitt is one of two Smithsonian museums in New York City. Cooper Hewitt is on the move as we expand our galleries and we're moving into a number of places throughout New York over the next two years. We're here at the United Nations with the Design with the Other 90% Cities exhibition along with lecture cities around, uh, lectures around the city. Uh, we have a slide up here. Uh, to register and find out more about uh, upcoming exhibitions on Governor's Island in May and other lecture series around uh, New York, uh, you can go to cooperhewitt.org. Uh, just curious, how many people in the audience tonight have seen the exhibition? Wow. I think one of our panel members, because <laughs> <laughs> he works in the... Uh, well, if you haven't, it's uh, open daily and free to the general public until January 9th, uh, 2012. Uh, we also have plans to travel it. It looks like it's going uh, to, to a location in the south, on the west coast, and also a location in the Midwest. Design uh, with the other 90% cities is a second in a series of ex exhibitions that explore the ways in which design can respond to the world's most critical issues. It was conceived to broaden an exchange of knowledge among people living in our growing cities, architects and designers, non-governmental organization, our policymakers, and it examines how design addresses complex issues arising from the unprecedented rate of urban growth projected to take place over the next 20 years the human habitat estimates that close to one billion people currently live in informal settlements, more commonly known as slums, favelas, squatter communities. This number is projected to grow to two billion by the year 2030. Most of that growth is gonna take place in emerging and developing economies throughout the global south in an increasingly climate challenged world. The exhibition features 60 projects, products, and proposals from 25 different countries, from community generated to large urban scale projects, and they provide solutions for more inclusive, sustainable cities. If you'd like to further explore these ideas, you can go to our website. We have that information on the slide. You can join uh, the Design Other 90 Network and share your own work. 
Uh, it's a social network for people who are interested, professionals who are interested in this area of design. You can also follow us on Twitter. And this evening, if you are tweeting, uh, there, uh, we're actually uh, streaming this live on uh, the web, you can use the hashtag Oscar Niermeyer, just to reference this conversation tonight. Why we're here. We're here to celebrate a giant in the field of design and architecture, Oscar Niemeyer, whose work embodies the highest ideals and gives form to inspiring ideas. I have to confess, when I was uh, doing my research for the exhibition, I traveled to 16 different cities throughout the global south, uh, and I, uh, one of the locations was Sao Paulo. And I took time out. I couldn't help myself. I had to make a pilgrimage to a number of the uh, buildings designed by Oscar Niemeyer. It was quite, uh, quite amazing. So tonight, Cooper Hewitt, the nation's design museum, is very pleased to partner with UN's Academic Impact Initiative in organizing this esteemed panel. And I look forward to hearing more about how the design of buildings, such as the United Nation, can transform our city and the world. Thank you. Cynthia Smith is the Curator for Socially Responsible Design at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. And it's extremely fitting that uh, we have this partnership as uh, the tagline that we have for the United Nations Academic Impact is sharing a culture of intellectual social responsibility. Thank you, Cynthia. So tonight we are celebrating Oscar Niemeyer. He was the youngest member of the 11 architect team which was responsible for the design of the UN headquarters complex in 1948. They built, they designed the uh, complex in actually four months. As you no, and as Cynthia has reminded us, he, Oscar Niemeyer later became world famous as the architect of Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, and he has produced many iconic buildings around the world, and at 104, he's still working, and he's still quite busy, as some of us around the room could tell, <laughs> could tell us. Um, one year ago today, uh, actually on the 15th of December uh, 2010, just one month, less than a month actually, after we had officially launched the UN Academic Impact, UNAI, the UN Academic Impact, had its first European conference in Aviles, Spain, at Centro Niemeyer. Uh, the, the event had been scheduled to coincide with uh, the 103rd birthday of Oscar Niemeyer, and on that day, uh, the cupola of the, was the first building of the Centro Niemeyer, which was inaugurated. We are thrilled that tonight we have with us the director of Centro Niemeyer, who has been able to join us. He arrived about two hours ago, and <laughs> just in time to, to be with us. Um, so thank you so much, Natalio, for making the trip, especially to be with us. I would also like to recognize in the audience Karin Davison, who was also with us last year in the celebration of the uh, Centro Niemeyer. Natalio Gresso. Uh, will be part of our panel discussion tonight. Before becoming Centro Niemeyer's director, he was director of international relations at the Prince of Asturias Foundation. And before that, he was director of interregional cooperation at the European Commission, where he managed over 200 uh, and 250 cooperation programs in more than 40 countries. Mr. Grosso has also been managing director of DEX Limited, an international consultancy company and he's a graduate in law and international relations. Together with Mr. Groisso on the panel tonight, we have Anthony Cohn, Barry Lewis, and Cesar Pelli. Anthony Cohn is principal and senior designer in EYP's New York office. From the past seven years, he has served as design and planning principal for the General Assembly and conference buildings at UN headquarters. Mr. Cohn has designed buildings for a variety of project types, including educational facilities, historic structures, corporate offices and office buildings, and residential buildings. A graduate of Yale and the University of Pennsylvania, 
Mr. Cohn is a member of the American Institute of Architects and lead accredited. Barry Lewis is an architectural historian who specializes in European and American architecture of the 18th to 20th century. Educated at the University of California at Berkeley, the Sorbonne in Paris, and the New School for Social Research, he currently teaches at both Cooper Union uh, Forum and the New York School of Interior Design. His courses cover architecture and interior design in Europe and America since the 18th century and the history of New York City architecture and city planning. Mr. Lewis has produced many videos and writes extensively on historic neighborhoods around New York City. Cesar Pelli is senior principal at Pelli Clark Pelli Architects. Mr. Pelli was born in Argentina where he graduated in architecture at the University of Tucumán. He has worked in the, his early days with Eero Sarinen on several buildings, including the TWA terminal of JFK Airport, and later DM, DMJD, M, sorry, and Green Associates in Los Angeles. In 1977, Mr. Pelli became dean of the School of Architecture at the University, at Yale University, and he also founded Cesar Pelli and Associates. He resigned his post as dean in 1984, but continues to lecture on architecture. Mr. Pelli, Pelli has received 12 honorary degrees, over 200 awards for design excellence, and in 1995, he, the American Institute of Architects awarded Mr. Pelli the gold medal in recognition of a lifetime of distinguished achievement in architecture. In 2004, Mr. Pelli also was awarded the Aga Khan Award for architecture for the design of the Petronas Towers in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So we do have a very impressive panel with us tonight. Uh, before we start our discussion, we will watch a short historical video which was produced by a colleague of ours in the, uh, in the United Nations Department of Public Information, Chaim Litovsky, who is the chief of the television section at the UN and who is present tonight here. Thank you very much, Chaim. New York's Museum of Modern Art paid tribute recently to the designers of one of the city's and the world's most recognizable architectural landmarks. It's the United Nations headquarters complex, and the exhibit was part of events celebrating the UN's 50th anniversary. It traced the development of the headquarters as an expression of post-war optimism transcending national styles and traditions. Museum of Modern Art curator Peter Reed. It was one of the largest building projects at the time. Uh, it was an important symbolic building, uh, without doubt, um, essentially a kind of world capital. Uh, and it, from the outset, it was going to be a modern building. Many nations vied for the honor of hosting the United Nations headquarters. In 1946, it was decided it should be in the United States. New York City was chosen after the Rockefeller family donated eight and a half million dollars to purchase the construction site. What was to become one of the most modern structures in the world was built in what was then a slaughterhouse district, a rundown neighborhood on Manhattan Island's east side. As the area was small, the headquarters had to be high rise. The presence of granite bedrock near the surface meant the 39-story complex would rest, physically at least, on secure foundations. Wallace Harrison from the United States led the team of architects from around the world. They put together the design concept in just four months. Among the group were two men who were to be the most influential in the final shape of the project. Clearly the two strongest designers on that team were Le Corbusier and Oscar Niemeyer, the youngest architect at the time. He was only 39 years old. It was Corbusier and Niemeyer's concept that was to be erected on the newly cleared site. Critics warned it would be a monstrous tower of Babel, but what finally emerged is now regarded as one of the most successful modern buildings of its time. A Brazilian communist, Niemeyer, was eventually refused admittance to the US, and it was 20 years before he could see the results of his UN work. Now 88, he's the only surviving member of the UN design team. 
He became one of the century's most prominent architects. He designed Brasilia, his country's capital city. But for Niemeyer, physical design is not the most important consideration. The main thing about the UN is not the building itself, but rather how the UN conducts global politics. Architecture, in this case, is secondary. Global politics have indeed changed. When the plans were drawn up, there were 55 UN member states. Today, there are 185. Opened in 1950, the United Nations headquarters stands as a great modern structure, an architectural style setter which has influenced high-rise building design across the world. This has been a report from the United Nations. One correction from the, uh, from the video, the United Nations has now 193 members. <laughs> Mr. Lewis, I'm going to start with you. Um, as uh, mentioned in the, um, in the video, at the time of construction, critics warned UN headquarters would become a monstrous Tower of Babel. And the building is now recognized as one of the most successful modern buildings of its times and an architectural style setter. Would you agree with this assessment? And also, how do you think the architecture in New York has changed over the past 60 years? Well, uh, what, what amazes me is uh, I remember when I was a little kid coming here and playing on the Esplanade. And it was one of the first uh, times that the middle class had access to the East River since probably the Industrial Revolution began. And that's the extraordinary thing about the UN, is that it's the precedent for all of this riverfront uh, development. Uh, these days, the last 15 years, uh, it's all been concentrated on the Hudson River side of the island, uh, because after all, that was the port of New York uh, from the 1850s until the 1970s. And with the uh, construction of, everyone talks about the High Line, and they did a wonderful job, but I'm fascinated by Hudson River Park because that's the real workaholic park on that side of the island that allows all those new condos on 10th and 11th to have some place to go and jog and bicycle and walk and whatever. And it really is the working park of that part of the island. And I realize that it's now time for the east side. Uh, in the next boom, we hope there'll be a next boom. Um, in the next boom, uh, you can already see with Frank Gehry's tower going up and the East River Esplanade being built uh, downtown, which will gradually, of course, eventually come up here, uh, that it's now time for the east side to be redeveloped, whether we like that or not, but it's time for that to happen. And the UN kind of pointed the way. Nobody in those days, ever, and no middle class person ever went to the river. Many of you are younger than I am. In those days, when I was a kid, if you put your hand in the Hudson River, they took you to a hospital and gave you a shot. So uh, to see, see people kayaking off the piers on the Hudson River is really quite extraordinary. The UN started all that. I was mentioning this to Anthony before we came in, that it was the first time as a kid I actually went over to the river and could look at it. I mean, be, I grew up with Coney Island. I grew up with the oceans. I grew up with water around me. But you, in Manhattan, you never went near the water. You just did. And uh, the UN was the first opening up of the riverfront. And it's extraordinary how much it looked forward to a post-industrial world, which in 1947, I don't think anyone foresaw, uh, but it did. And if you're asking about the difference between now and 60 years ago, uh, 60, I think 60, 70 years ago, it, it took something special to get, uh, don't forget the UN, of course, it's, it's a special event in the city. Uh, most buildings in New York City are built by private developers. And in those days, most private developers just wanted to get it up and built, which is what most developers want. I mean, we understand that there, it's a business. In those days, it took something special for them to hire uh, a great architect to do their development. As a matter of fact, I once, uh, uh, I attended something uh, by um, uh, Phyllis Lambert. She was speaking, she's the daughter of the Bronfman. She got her Bronfman father together with Mies van der and Philip Johnson. And what a fascinating story and quite a, you know, quite a bit of uh, 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 to and fro. Most developers didn't want to deal with that, and they just wanted to put it up. And in the last 25 years, New York has come back with a vengeance. We, some of us have lived through New York in the 70s, and we remember when everyone said New York would be a ghost town by the year 2000. In 1975, that was the going uh, knowledge. And in fact, of course, it came back with a vengeance, which, I mean, 
it's, it's better than being Detroit and nobody wanting you. So it's fascinating that today, with all the money invested in buildings, uh, developers have realized that if you hire a famous architect, a famous name architect or team, that just adds to the luster and also, I think, to the value of your building. Uh, but uh, I find in the last 15, 20 years what fascinated me is actually the redesign of our public space, which having grown up in New York in the 1950s uh, when it was a safe city, a middle class city, but our public space, you know who designed our public space back then, Robert Moses. So asphalt chain link and, and a sliding pond or a swing was what all you needed. The, uh, the really, the, the, the beautiful re redesign, I lived in Paris in the mid 60s to go to the Sorbonne. I was fascinated by the French concept of the square, these small parks around Paris that anybody can walk into and they're beautifully done and very much inhabited. And you come back to New York and it would be asphalt, broken asphalt, you know, and a, a, a traffic sign bent from the last truck. And the way in which our public space has come back, not come back, it never was there. I mean, it has really blossomed. And if you go to the west end of Canal Street, which was the armpit of the nation, as far as I can remember, you know, where Canal Street, 6th Avenue, Church, and the Holland Tunnel all converged. So what was there? To see the parks being built, and yes, the condos are all going up, but they are going up as part of a public space. We never really had that. We're a, we're a private developer country, and we're interested in private development, and this public space is what's left over that nobody's interested in. Well, now, Battery Park City pioneered that. I have to really give them the credit. Your World Financial Center is... <laughs> uh, I, I used to spend a lot of time there because uh, it was an amazing design in terms of public space. And in terms of, of, of the beauty of that, of that promenade, the small parks, and that was 25 years ago. And since then, uh, we have Herald Square, which you know was Pigeon City, I mean, until they redid it, and a few other cities we didn't want to know about. Well, they redid that, and all of the, uh, not just Hudson River Park, um, but uh, the spaces all around the city, every tiny little, uh, uh, little I say Carrefour, every tiny little triangle that was just a, a, a zoo and a mess and a, a broken asphalt, beautifully, beautifully reimagined. And it gives a framework for the buildings that are going up. We, we really gobble up buildings. We put up buildings, we say all kinds of things about them. Ten years later, they're forgotten and they just become part of the electricity of New York, but they kind of, they kind of just fade into the, into the New York you know, visual chaos. But the public space, I think, it's, I think that's going to be really a permanent, a permanent change in the way we see New York. Thank you. I will turn to uh, Mr. Pelly and ask him to, to, in a way, follow up on, on uh, Mr. Uh, Lewis's uh, presentation and ask you, how has public involvement in architectural planning and design changed over the last 60 years? I, I, I would like to ask, can you hear me? Yes. I, I would like to add to what Barry w w was, was saying. I believe that one of the things that made a huge difference in the development of public spaces in New York is the bid system, the, the, the business improvement districts, which allow for a collaborations of private and public. They, in some people believe that the Central Park Conservancy is a model, but that's arguable because the Central Park Conservancy depends primarily in fundraising. And, the, and, the, and, a, and a good bid means it's a, it's a true collaboration of, of neighbors, people who are going to benefit from it, and the public. Perhaps for me, the best first example is Bryant Park, which is extraordinary successful. Clearly, the High Line is one of the most recent, most noticeable, but I, I also agree with Barry. More important for me is the Hudson River Park. And I haven't visited yet, I have seen many photographs, I haven't visited yet the, the, the Brooklyn Bridge Park in, in Brooklyn, which I understand is also quite wonderful and is doing just marvelous things for that neighborhood. Yes, but I think those public spaces contribute more than any building can contribute, I shouldn't say that as an architect, but they go to, to, the, to the quality of life in a city, it's particularly a city so tightly packed as, as New York. What was interesting was for me, that just in the, in the period where the United Nations were built, this was, I should say, the most expected building ever. 
you know, I was in school studying architecture in the 40s, just the, the war finished, and there were talks about the United Nations, all countries coming together, which seemed quite unbelievable in itself. And when a building for this was going to be built, the expectations were this is going to be the most beautiful building in the world. And indeed, when the architects were selected and Le Corbusier was participating, we were all expecting a Le Corbusier building, which did not happen. The, it, the, I, I agree with the, with the considerations that probably the, the, the scheme that most impact had was Oscar Niemeyer's scheme. But it was developed by Harrison Abramovich. This is truly uh, based on the ideas of Niemeyer, but this is a Harrison Abramovich building. And it's one of the best buildings they ever did. It is a very good building. It is not a great building, not a great complex of building, but it is a good building. It does not compare with a building that came a couple of years later, which was the Signals building by Miss van der Rohe. And it certainly does not compare with a Pepsi-Cola building that Gordon Bush designed in 1960. What was extraordinary was that in that period of the 50s, very good architects were also being hired to design buildings. Not only Miss van der Rohe, Gordon Bullshaft, Eero Saarinen. And that sort of ceased for a long while until now. Now again, very good architects are being hired. And, and one of the big differences that I notice is that now, again, in the last 10, 12, 15 years, great residential buildings are being designed. The, in the 1920s and 30s, there were extraordinarily wonderful residential buildings being built all along Park Avenue. There were magnificent buildings. Emery Roth was a great architect, was very, very creative. I don't think his, Emery Roth is given proper credit for what he had done for New, for New York. And they, there are buildings like the Rockefeller Apartments, which are gorgeous, gorgeous buildings of the 1930s. But now, again, very great apartment buildings are being built. Probably, I don't, I'm not sure, Barry will know this better. I think that there were probably Richard Myers glass towers on the, on the West Side Highway were the first extraordinarily exceptional buildings. And they were so successfully commercially. I think that's what made the difference, that, that they became very much imitated. A few blocks down, you have the, the Jean Nouvel, apartment towers, now we have the Frank Gehry towers, and not, not a contemporary building, but a very fancy apartment tower is 15th Central Park West, designed by, in classical style by Robert Stern. We designed the Bloomberg building and, and, the, and, the, and the Visionaire in, the cent in Park, Park City, also very contemporary, very classy, very avant-garde buildings, all of them. And this is quite new. This is, this is bringing a sense of excitement to the city of New York and to living in New York. And even more complicated and more expensive apartment towers keep on being proposed. I do not know if they will ever happen, but they keep on being proposed in, in the city. But as much as these are all wonderful buildings, what has really made a difference are the, are the public spaces, are the public functions. The way that the museums have grown since, since the Second World War, since the 60s to now, is also amazing. One has to remember the Museum of Modern Art was a house. Mm. Basically, it was, it, was, it was designed like a house by, by, by Good, Philip Goodwin and Edward Durrell Stone. It was a lovely house, but it was a house which just went up the stairs, it went down, down a few rooms and went up up another level again. Now it's a huge, huge, huge too large in my, in my impression. But the, museum, the, the Metropolitan Museum has grown several times. The Whitney Museum used to be what, a small building next to the Museum of Modern Art, a brick building next to the Museum of Modern Art. Now it is a great institution and it's on, which is now moving down to next to the High Line. I have no idea how good a move that is, but it is a bold move, unquestionably. So, but all of this, and the galleries that we have in New York, all of Chelsea, we cannot walk more than a few steps and we're at another art gallery. The amount of art that is being offered to the general public in New York is extraordinary. 
in the 1950s and 60s, there were very few places where you could go and look at, particularly if you were interested in modern art, only the Museum of Modern Art offered it. Nobody else offered modern art. There was no modern art in the Metropolitan, and the Whitney did not exist. So that this, was, this has all, all changed in, enormously. This is, now, but all of this, of course, brings up a, a negative side is, is that phenomenal amount of gentrification. In, in New York, particularly in Manhattan. It's very difficult for the lower middle classes to try to hope to live in Manhattan. They used to have their enclaves where very people of very limited means used to live in Manhattan. Now they cannot. And I don't know what kind of a city this can become if only those very affluent people with, people with some level of wealth or good incomes can live in the city. It's, it's, a, it's, not a real, it's not a real city, I think. I think we need to make room for people of all incomes in this, in, in New York, or in any, in any city where one lives. I, I live in New Haven, Connecticut, so uh, I, I, I look at New York as, as, a, as an outsider. I have been visiting New York since I came to America in the 50s, and, but I have never lived here. So, and, and New Haven is a very mixed city. We have people that truly of only, there are really no wealthy, no really wealthy persons in New Haven, which is quite wonderful. This, you know, it's, a, it's a very middle class city. We have a substantial amount of very poor people in New Haven too, but it is a very mixed, and, and Manhattan is missing this. You know, one should take the bronze and sprinkle it throughout Manhattan, <laughs> and, 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 and the city, the city in my mind, would gain enormously. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Pelly. Uh, you've mentioned the uh, cultural offering that uh, New York brings. Yes, sorry, I, I was thanking you and saying, uh, you've mentioned the cultural offering that is available in, in New York. I'm now going to turn to uh, Natalia Cueso. Um, the UN headquarters was built in a rundown neighborhood uh, slaughterhouse district. Uh, you have been heading the Centro Niemeyer, which is a cultural uh, project. Can you uh, tell us where it was built and whether you think that uh, cultural projects that are uh, led by uh, landmark architectural buildings can lead to city regeneration and economic revival. Sure. I, I'm not an architect by education, but I have been lucky enough to share the last five years of my life working very closely with, with Oscar Niemeyer. And uh, certainly we have uh, built his uh, largest work in Europe, and in his own words, his favorite work he has ever done. Uh, and certainly it's in a small village, 85,000 inhabitants, very polluted, northern Spain. I will tell you something about that in a moment. But before, I think that um, you cannot understand the work of Oscar Niemeyer if you don't understand his vision of life. Everything he does is connected to how he sees the world. And... Uh, so maybe I can share with you some ideas about how is his um, creative process, how he works, because it's quite innovative, I would say, even now. Um, Niemeyer says that the most important thing in life is not architecture. The important thing is trying to change the world. He has his ideology. He worries about how the world is going, and he is very much connected to that Brazil of the 40s, the 30s, when he uh, grew up, in which the difference between rich and poor people was really important. So one of the things he always says is that, that he wanted to make, to create beauty, because if you, he says, if you build an ugly building and inside is very beautiful, only the rich people could benefit of that. But if you build something which is really, really nice, really beautiful from outside, everyone can benefit on that. So <clears throat> that creates one of the first things how he approached to the work. Second one is that he always, before starting work, sends you a letter, which what he calls the explicação necessaria, the, the, the necessary explanation. Uh, because before starting even to sketch, he wants to know if the client really understands what he wants to do. <clears throat> and I think that's something which uh, is quite, I would say, even unique, even, even now. Uh, and it's a very, I would say, handicraft work 
of, uh, of wor way of working, even, even now. Third thing is his, his uh, generosity. And let me share with you how I met Nimair and how we start working together. I went to visit him to, to his studio, to Rio de Janeiro, five years ago, uh, with the aim of asking him a favor, a contribution to a celebration. He had received an award in Spain, alongside with many other people. We were celebrating an anniversary, 25th anniversary of those awards, and uh, we were asking all the past award winners to contribute to the celebration. We wanted him to give a talk on his work, uh, and I went there for a meeting that I thought would last for 15, 20 minutes, and uh, we spent the whole day together. And at the end, he said, listen, um, of course I'm going to contribute to that, but you know, what the musicians do? And I say, well, they are going to do a concert. And uh, what the writers do? They are going to give a talk. So, well, I'm an architect, so I'm going to give you, as a present, a building. And uh, that's how we started the whole, uh, the whole project, with this uh, present of Nehemiah. So this, the generosity is a very important part of his character. Another part of his character I think is crucial to understand his work is that he's a global artist. He really makes all the arts. He is a fantastic uh, architect, obviously, but he's a poet, and he's a writer, and he's a composer. Two years ago, when he was 102 years old, he was really ill. He went into hospital and had a very serious surgery. And uh, the family, the friends, we all were very sad and saying, well, this looks really, really terrible. You know what he did? He composed a samba of this traditional <laughs> song. And the samba was called Tranquilo con la vida, which means uh, something like satisfied with my life. Uh, in a very positive way to really cheer up the whole of the people, everybody who were around, around him. So this is Niemeyer. What happened in our place? I'm taking your, your question, Natalie. Uh, we, this city, uh, this small city in northern Spain, had the uh, privilege to be considered the second most polluted town in Europe 20 years ago. <laughs> so imagine. Uh, it was an industrial city, steel works, ship rats, everything collapsed, the whole economy, up to a level of 60% unemployment in the city 20 years ago. And uh, this project that Niemeyer has done has regenerated completely the city, has attracted investment, investment, tourism, just to give you some figures, I told you before, 85,000 inhabitants, more than one million visitors in six months since we opened this, have uh, contributed to transform uh, the whole town to attract new companies, to give quality of life to the people, and especially, I think, is probably the most important part of all, to give back the pride of being a native of that town, which was completely lost. I think this is probably the most important part of, uh, of his work. So definitely, I think, I mean, architecture uh, linked to culture can transform a city. Uh, but there's another important point, which uh, Niemeyer always says, is that he wants to work with cheap materials. He doesn't want to do very expensive things which are uh, difficult to maintain. So he always works with, uh, with concrete, which is the most basic and simple material. So that again goes uh, close to what I said at the beginning, that you cannot understand the work of Niemeyer if you don't understand his vision of the, of the world. When, uh, when Juscelino Kubitschek, the, the president of Brazil, called him to build Brasilia, what he did was to invite, to come with him, not only engineers and construction works and so uh, workers and, and people like that. He brought poets and musicians and uh, writers and they all worked together there and that's probably what explained the miracle that in only five years they built a whole city and they built uh, pieces of art that I think are now, I mean, Cathedral of Brasilia from my point of view is one of the most amazing uh, and innovative buildings. It's a change of how to design the cathedral in, in centuries. So, well, yeah, this is, this is uh, Nimaya, but I have to say that I'm uh, not being very honest with you all because what I've done to tell you all these things was uh, talking to him to <laughs> congratulate him for the uh, birthday and uh, asking him, what do you want me to say? And uh, what he said is send the message that we all have to contribute to change the world.
Thank you so much, Natalia Owen. Uh, changing the world, well, that is uh, part of the mandate of the United Nations. Uh, I'm going to turn to uh, Mr. Cohn. You are working in the team that is mandated to uh, uh, adapt UN headquarters to 21st century standards. What challenges are you facing as an architect that uh, when you need to update an iconic building? And what would you say is the key challenge of updating the UN building to uh, fit 21st century needs? I, I, I think the, excuse me, I think the, the key challenge here is, is to be true to the essential nature of the building and to the spirit of the original designers. I, I, the, 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 one of the first things that, that we did was um, go back to, um, well, actually we all read uh, Workshop for Peace, which was uh, George Dudley's book. He was one of the uh, participants in, the, in all of the meetings, and tried, and I think reasonably successfully, to impress on the other teams working on the project that we really all were working on a single project, and we really all had to work, to continue to work together. And I think that, that one of the, the tendencies that we've had to continually kind of resist is the tendency to make things fancier. Um, this is a very kind of workaday building with very simple, beautifully made and amazingly maintained details. But everything is very simple. There aren't lots of fancy materials. It was intended really from the very start to be a workshop, to be a place where people came to work toward peace. And I think that the, the hardest thing for architects working now is to, to try and retain that sense of um, the social responsibility that everyone who worked on the project in, in, in the 40s really felt. Um, has that sort of fallen, I think to a large extent, fell by the wayside. Um, certainly was a lot less true when, when, when I was a student. And, I, and I, I think that that's been a very important and critical challenge. And also there's the sort of all of the obvious things that the, the campus was built when there were 55 nations and they designed it thinking of expansion for 70 and um, at, there are now 193 and there were some 800 meetings a year planned in uh, 1947 and there are 10 times that many meetings now and so that the the buildings get a lot more wear um, they're a lot more used uh, and it is to the credit of the, of the organization that throughout the years they did, they lovingly maintained the building, but didn't spend a lot of money on the bricks and mortar and spent money on programs. And now to a certain extent, um, uh, all of the sort of gently deferred maintenance um, is being taken care of at once. And, all the infrastructure is being replaced and the building is being brought up to modern, modern code and um, not just building code but um, uh, accessibility <clears throat> and as near as, as much as possible, even just the installation of new systems, um, we've been able to uh, improve its performance in terms of energy and all of that, all, doing all of that, we've tried very hard to maintain the building's appearance. I think Caesar asked me before we, we started, well, what's it going to look like when it's done? And I think uh, our goal is that for those who don't really know what we're, what, don't really know the history of the, of the campus and of the buildings, that when we're done, you'll wonder what we did. The idea is that it's sort of, we, we haven't been here. Um, that's not quite true, but it, um, as much as possible, we're really trying to do that. And I think that's really the hardest challenge, is how do you put the new technology in? How do you, um, how do you restore uh, the furniture or the, the, the battens on the walls? Uh, and at the same time, uh, you don't want it to look new, you want it to look lovingly cared for, which it has been. And I think that, uh, that that's the sort of interesting challenge of the project. Thank you very much. I, I like what you <laughs> said, that uh, we will uh, not notice what you've done, in a way. Um, Mr. Pelly, 
uh, Oscar Niemeyer was the youngest architect in the team that was led by uh, Wallace Harrison. He was 39. Um, and in the video that we, uh, we saw, he stated that the main thing about the UN is not about the building itself, but uh, now how the UN conducts global politics. Does that view support your belief that buildings should be responsible citizens? And could you share some observations uh, to the, for the young architects? You wrote a book in 1999, and could you share some of these uh, observations? I, I, I certainly believe that buildings should be responsible citizens. The, the, I, I believe that the, the greatest work of art that human beings create is the city. And the city involving everything, involving the buildings, involving the open spaces, involving the people living there, creating there, living there. And each building should contribute to that great work of art. For the building standing by itself and calling attention for it by itself is very rarely needed. If one designs a building like the United Nations or a cathedral, those buildings indeed deserve to be calling attention to itself. But if one designs an office building or an apartment house, why should they call attention to themselves? There is no reason whatsoever. They should be very beautiful and they should primarily contribute to make a better city. That's what I mean by being responsible citizens. They should all the build everything I design. I try to do it so that they contribute to make the place where the building will be built better by its inclusion. So the neighbor should be, should feel better. The whole neighborhood should feel better. The whole city should be better by that addition. You know, every building we build does some damage to the quality of air, of life, everything we build. The best thing would be not to build anything. This is my, my profession, going down the drain, but that would be the very best thing we could do. But if we have to build, then we should do it with as much care as possible for, so the building is sustainable, so that it has the slightest possible carbon footprint, so that it is respectful of neighbors, so that it is, if, if one deals with near or nearby or part of valuable buildings, like he's working with, with the buildings of the United Nations, so all of what we have learned about preservation is incredibly valuable. This is one of the great contributions of the late 20th century, it's the whole concern for preservation. And even later in the 20th century and the 21st century is the concern for sustainability. Those are two of the most important and valuable trends in architecture to have come around in a very, very long time. Pres you know, preservation and, sustainab and sustainability. But to me, those are just part of being responsible. So for, for me, an architect works not for himself or herself. An architect works for society. And it's a, it's a responsibility that we have to society in everything we do so that the building has to be as responsible as, as possible. And that's what I mean by being responsible citizens. Thank you. Mr. Cohn, I'm going to go back to you and ask you what you think uh, collaboration and integration mean as an architect. And has this changed from the 20th to the 21st century? I think the, 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 the biggest change in the, in the way that architects collaborate um, maybe in the, the sort of the whole uh, post-war era uh, has a lot to do with how complicated buildings are. Um, we have, we kind of take for granted, uh, I think, how technologically complex every building is. Um, uh, almost everything in almost every building is in fact computer driven. Uh, 60 years ago, uh, you could uh, you could design uh, you could design a building, and you'd have a structural engineer if it were a big enough building, and a mechanical engineer if it were in a complicated enough climate, and that would probably be enough. And in in some ways, the the big transformation happened here. 
that the, the, the UN is one of the first, um, is one of the f um, first campuses uh, that has a really sort of consciously designed lighting program, <coughs> excuse me, uh, where, the, where the lighting is part of the expression of the architecture and the building is meant to be thought about at night and seen at night. Um, the UN is one of the first, is the first building built um, with um, uh, facilities for simultaneous interpretation as part of the original design. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the charming, only word, one of the charming things about the original design report was the, um, the way that the design team extolled all of the electronic technology, the, um, that they were going to have television so that people didn't actually have to be in the room to see what was happening at a meeting. They were going to have teletype and they were going to have telephones everywhere. Um, it was the, the, the sort of technology that, that we really do take for granted. And, and I think that that has led to much larger teams and a sort of diluted, unfortunately, a diluted um, authority on a project so that it's no longer quite so much in the control, the design is not, not, not quite so much in the control of the architect, uh, yes, as it was um, maybe 60 years ago. And I, th I think that's been, been a big, big change and maybe not always a change for the better, although the technological improvements are very important. Um, one of the other things about, about the UN campus that is sort of neglected because we talk a lot about design and, and think about design as, as shapes and forms and materials. This is an incredibly well-planned campus. And the way that people in a normal day move from here to there, for the, whether they're you know, from the office tower to meetings or, or from even from the street from First Avenue to meetings, the movement and circulation of people in this, in this campus in this complex uh, is remarkable and it's always worked very well and I think that the sort of functional aspect of the UN headquarters is kind of ignored sometimes and is certainly something that we weren't fully aware of until we started working on the project and it's not that there was anything that needed fixing that wasn't a technological problem you know, air conditioning units that were just worn out. It's, it's really remarkable and that's really, a, that's really a, a, a testament to the, the very brilliant work of Harrison and Abramowitz. The view of the architect, now I would like to, to turn to Natalio and ask you as a user, what do you think about collaboration? I mean, uh, you've been working with Oscar Niemeyer on the building of Centro Niemeyer. I think, yeah, I, I think it, that's probably one of the key points. It's absolutely vital uh, to make a team between the architect and the user of the buildings. Um, Niemeyer wanted, during the process of, uh, of this construction, which is quite complex because we have a big auditorium, we have cinemas, we have an exhibition hall, uh, we have uh, meeting rooms. He wanted to meet personally or to speak personally with every single member of the team to ask what your needs are, what do you need from me, how can we work together on this, how can we improve this. And uh, I could tell you some funny stories, for instance in the cinema, which is a room similar like this one, he changed the distance between uh, the seats to make to give more space because he said that uh, the people who are young uh, well they don't mind to wake up to let someone crossing by but he's very old and he said that he doesn't like when he goes to a theater and there's not enough room and he has to move and so on so things, things like that for instance uh, he worked a lot on, on that uh, from my point of view one of the worst or one of the main problems of some modern or recent architecture uh, and I can speak probably only about cultural complexes, is that sometimes the architect don't care at all about what's going to happen inside the building. I have seen auditoriums in which the elevator was not big enough to accommodate a piano, for instance. So there are a lot of uh, examples and we could pick up some case studies about that. Uh, Niemeyer, fortunately, is completely the opposite. I mean, he likes to 
work directly with every single member of the team and every single user. And again, I mean, he wants to know what is the vision of, uh, of the whole project. He, uh, he described the work he did for us as an open square for education, culture, and peace. And it's just a definition, but everything goes around that concept, everything. He has given a present to the town. There was a, a place which was completely polluted and relicted, and now it's an open square where people go with the dogs or with the bikes or just uh, for jogging to enjoy a concert or to enjoy an exhibition. So everything has to be coordinated with the users and with the vision of the people who has asked the, the project. Thank you. We've been uh, discussing uh, Centro de Mayer, which is uh, 2008, maybe uh, the construction. No. We, we started the construction in the, um, uh, 2000 and, yeah, mid 2008. Okay, yes. so 2008, the design team that worked on the UN building was working in 1948, so these are 60 years apart. And I'm going to turn to Mr. Lewis and ask you, what, in your view, has been the defining characteristic of mid to late 20th century architecture, and what you think will be the defining characteristic of the uh, early 21st century architecture? Well, I think when it's all said and done, really, it, it, it's the fact that in the late 20th century, uh, at least Americans rediscovered cities. And uh, I grew up in a world where everybody had to... We, we used to go to the shopping mall because that was just the most amazing thing in the world we'd ever seen. And you could actually park for free. And uh, I remember when, one by one, every family was taking off and moving to the suburbs. And now we have a stroller brigade here in New York that uh, is second to none. And it's amazing that people who have children have decided that this is the city to have them in. We have come full circle. And uh, maybe we are wanted too much by people. Uh, you can see that by the real estate in New York and what it's doing to our city. And Caesar, you're absolutely right about that in terms of gentrification. But you know, it's, this is a market-driven city. It always has been. It is the, uh, living in Paris was an interesting uh, a contrast because Paris is a city that is built by the pharaohs. Uh, they call them presidents of France, but they're really pharaohs. And uh, they, uh, they, they, they dictate and uh, they get it done. And they really leave their mark on the city. And uh, we are a city of a zillion developers, uh, whether it's Silverstein down at the World Trade Center or it's a tiny developer putting up some little brick job in Queens. But we are a private developer city. And um, we will always be that way. Uh, but the interesting thing is, uh, and it goes back again to this public space uh, issue, is that we've rediscovered being in the city and enjoying the city. And that's one thing the Parisians taught me 45 years ago when I lived there for two years. They love their city. They love being in a city. And the things they did on the streets of Paris, I may have come from New York, but we didn't do those things on the streets of New York. <laughs> and um, now we do more in the streets of New York, they do less in the streets of Paris. But they taught me about, about enjoying the city. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's amazing. You can stroll almost anywhere in Europe and, and you say, when I get back home and get off that plane, I'm going to stroll around New York. That lasts about five minutes. But it, it's still, we're learning to enjoy our city and places like Hudson River Park and many of the, and we all know the High Line, but places, uh, all, these, all these public spaces that are being built, they are like our square. They are like, they're becoming our outdoor living rooms. And being Anglos, we really are not, I think in our cultural genes, we don't have that. You know, you, you, most of you have been to the UK, and you know, it all goes on behind the closed door of the pub and that kind of thing. And uh, yes, I mean, they're changing too, the English, but, but we inherited from the English the idea of being private. And we don't do our thing on the street the way the Latins do. But, you, know, <laughs> you know that, right? <laughs> and so it's fascinating to see this change, and that, that changes how buildings are built. Uh, they, someone gave me a cartoon many years ago from the New Yorker. It was wonderful. And this is from the 70s period. And it shows you typical high-rise building, you know, isolated tower with a plaza. And there was a drawbridge from the building to the city. And at 9 a.m., everybody would go into the tower. And at 9.05, the drawbridge would come up. And it, at 5, you had 5 to 5, the drawbridge would end and everybody would leave. And then it would come back up. And that was so true. Uh, the interesting thing is, you know, they're redoing Water Street. 
Water Street, uh, I remember when it was all uh, cobblestones and it was part of the old 19th century seaport. Well, they're redoing it because they did it, they rebuilt Water Street in 1970. It has got to be the most god-awful example of how not to design a city in the world. I mean, there are 55,000, 60,000 people working along Water Street. Do you ever see them? I mean, there's nothing, no wonder. They get out of the building and they run because there's absolutely nothing to hold them to Water Street. It would be interesting to see what happens when they do finish the job. Uh, and it may be in a year or two. But uh, because Water Street is the best example of how not to design a city, and when they finish this redesign, it may be one of the best examples. I don't know. I, I haven't seen it. But that's what's happening. We are rediscovering our cities and the spaces in them and, and learning to inhabit the spaces. And that's not really something... Yeah, we were street people in a, in a very basic way, we New Yorkers, but my idea of the street was being in the... Uh, standing on the yellow line in the middle of Jamaica Avenue waiting for the, the traffic to go by. Because even when you were 10, nobody would stop for a 10-year-old kid to cross the street. That was my idea of public space. <coughs> and now to... Um, I just can't get over being able to walk into these squares and parks and watch people, especially the younger people, who don't remember what it was like in the 70s when you just held everything tight to you. You never put anything down unless your hand was on it and maybe perhaps a handcuff connected to it. And it's just changed, and I have to get used to that. You know, I, I just have to get used to it. That's the upside of the gentrification of the city, that we all know the downside. But that is the upside. And I think that buildings may reflect that more and more, and I think they are reflecting that. I mean, Mr. Well, Pelley's in no, the end no, no, no question for those of us that live here. Things have gotten better and better, but many, many others have been squeezed now. Oh, I, listen, we, 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 I mean, I, grew, I, I, I was born across from the old Madison Square Garden at 8th Avenue, 50th Street. And I used to go to the old Madison Square because my father used to take my brother and I to the fights. Ah, wow. And that's a city that, hey, this is New York, and every 20 years, it just totally changes. And, I mean, the great thing about New York is we still do have the Bronx, and we do have Queens. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly everybody's finding a restaurant in Astoria, you know, or, or finding the new digs in the Bronx to go. It is the nature of this city. So maybe in the future, Manhattan will just be so rich, we'll just have to go to the Bronx to have, you know, our, our little uh, good breakfast or whatever, our little fine, we'll have to go to Astoria or Jackson Heights. But that is the nature of the city. It just constantly reinvents itself. You go away for a month and you come back and you say, what happened? But... Um, I, I know the gentrification really bothers me because I love I loved the grittiness of the city. But you know something in the city? Grittiness finds its way. Somehow it just <laughs> finds its way. It's the nature of us. I was in San Diego for the first time, and I was in a lovely hotel, and I'm parked next to the garbage dump. And I said to the guy behind the desk, I'm from New York, what can I say? I just gravitate to the garbage <laughs> because of all the spaces. He said, why are you parked there? I said, I don't know, but that's where I pulled in. I guess it's my instincts. So. Um, uh, we're all here, you know, and we know what's happening to the city. Um, but it, it, it is an exciting time to be in New York. And sometimes, you know, it's New York, right? Sometimes you hate this place. And then you turn around and you say, but you know, it's the only place like it. So, I mean, for better or for worse, we have the city of the 21st century. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like now to take questions from the audience. Uh, the if you are seated in the uh, third last row, you will need a mic. But if you are sitting in the front, you don't need a mic. You have uh, little mics around. So any, any question for, please. Um, I, I happen to be an architect, and I work for the UN. And I enjoyed tremendously what you just uh, mentioned, all of you. And I learned a lot from you. So please don't misunderstand my question. But I would like to be deliberately provocative. Because the only problem of this meeting so far is that we've been agreeing too much with each other. So my question is about the future of architecture. Because we talk about green buildings and about sustainability. However, we seem to see buildings as computer-controlled, uh, uh, contained units that are more and more isolated from the environment. And this is in, not in any way any criticism to what you just said. But I fear that the future of architecture is further isolating people from the environment. For example, what is so wrong to work by the East River and enjoy once in a while the breeze from the East River if I work there? So, 
You are right. The computer is marvelous. It allows us to do many things that we could only dream about 20, 30 years ago. And uh, one of those is that we can work very efficiently all over the world. That it would have been unthinkable 20, 30 years ago. But it has to be the problem that the computer takes over the design. It's impossible to stop it. They, one believes that one is designing with a computer, but the, the truth is that the computer is designing with us. And, and the computer has certain oh, imperatives. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they tend to design, and the, and, the, and the computer tends to design buildings that are self-contained, unquestionably, and that tend to be self-referential. And it's very easy to do very complex buildings, and, and it's becoming easier and more reasonable to build very complex buildings just because it's possible, not because the complexity adds anything to the building or to the city. Many, many complex buildings are very complex buildings. There's really no reason for the complexity, and no, no rhyme or reason for it, but it's possible. It's, the computer allows it to design it precisely, to calculate all of the members and to build it. And this is all thanks to the computer, yes. No, the, 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 com the computer is a, it's, 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 it's indeed very, very serious because it does, it does tend to, in many ways, tend to control us as much as we control it. I, I, th I think there are, it, I, I think that there's also, um, a larger issue that is a little bit of a holdover from the last 50 years. Uh, and, and that is that if, if we think about the principles and ideals of Oscar Niemeyer and of the first and in that sense second generation of modern architects, they were concerned primarily with social justice and improving people's lives. And that sort of, that was the one element that fell out of the architectural program in the 50s. And that's most apparent, more apparent in New York maybe than almost anywhere else. And if you look at this building, and you look even, not even at the Seagram building, but even just at Lever House, which is more or less contemporaneous with the, um, with the Secretariat building, the um, Lever House is, a commercial building. New York is a commercial city. New York's monuments of the last 60 years, with two exceptions, Lincoln Center and um, the United Nations, large monuments, uh, are commercial monuments. And I think that, that up until recently, that loss of social consciousness, that loss of a sense of social responsibility on the part of architects and building owners, uh, had largely disappeared. And that maybe is the, is the, in a way, the best hope going forward that architects and developers will begin to see um, that, that fulfilling that responsibility that we all have as sort of professionals making our city, um, that fulfilling that responsibility uh, is in fact part of that unspoken program. And there are buildings in New York that are beginning to do that in, in a very real way, new buildings. Uh, but I think that that's maybe what's been missing, and optimistically. Example of these new buildings? Um, I think the Bank of America Tower, which is a, um, a platinum lead building on, um, uh, at the corner of uh, edge of Bryant Park, uh, is a building that undoubtedly cost the developers a lot more money to build than if they had built just the minimum, paid, paid a sort of minimum fealty to sustainability, the, then the minimum that they could do to get by and get the building approved by the city. And they made a number of tremendous innovations that altered the building code, altered the way that the city of New York began to look at sustainability. And so that sense, on the part of the developer and the architects, that sense of social responsibility was really very important. And that, that's maybe the best example because it's so big. But um, there are other examples, I, I think, of, of buildings like that that begin to do that. But it's very recent. Please.
enlightening. Um, uh, what, I'm sorry. One of the most interesting things is that in exactly at the moment when the UN was being planned, uh, the United States, in some ways, by virtue of just two policies, first the housing policy of 1949 and then the Highway Act of 1956, completely transformed cities. And it was almost inadvertent, but these two created the perfect storm where cities emptied out and suburbs became much more important. Just at the time when the last era of heroic architecture was being built. Um, and today we see in Highland Park the idea of just one small piece of this um, you know, transportation infrastructure coming back, back to the people. In many ways, it's not just the grittiness of the city, but it's really the highways of the city that New York has been spared of some of them by virtue of the fact that uh, the grid of the street was already there until you don't have too many highways inside the city, whereas you do have it in other cities. But How do you... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you... Do you see this transformation that you're talking about in, in, in terms of social responsibility as really recognizing how we can take back the, the transportation arteries that once destroyed cities to be more um, amenable to the, the communal sense of cities. This would be. <laughs> mm. um. <coughs> Well, you know, it, it, it's fascinating. I'm just having lived in America in the life I've lived through. Um, it, it fascinates me to see the, the change in this country. Um, as I was mentioning from the fact that I, I, go out, I go out into America, I can't believe th this country, nobody walks. And this is a city where everybody walks. And everybody, uh, they, I, I was in LA and I couldn't believe the traffic in LA. And then of course I realized they're, they're the second largest city in the United States but they have no means of getting around except by a car. And this is what happens. It, what happens is Interstate 10. It just, it's a parking lot forever, 405. It's a parking lot forever. And I came back to New York, and I couldn't believe it. I, I, I came into Newark Airport. I live in Queens. It was 10.30 p.m. the Thursday before the July 4th weekend. I zipped through the highways, and boom, I was home in uh, 20 minutes because all of the 8 million people and 16 million people in the metro area, they're taking the New Jersey Transit, Long Island Railroad, they're taking the subway, they're taking the buses. They don't have that choice in L.A. And it fascinated me the difference it made in the both city. I liked L.A., by the way. It's the first time I ever was in L.A. I was through it 100 times in, as a Berkeley student. Nobody in the car would let me stop. <laughs> Nobody would let me stop. I wanted to see Hollywood. I wanted to be a tourist. Nobody. They, they were all from L.A. And they screamed at me. And so I, it was the first time I was in L.A., and it was fascinating to see a, a very interesting, lively city, but built only on the car. And we may have... I, I'm not sure if... Uh, they, they're, by the way, their subway is very interesting and, and, and quite beautiful, if, even if it doesn't go anywhere you want to go. But um, I came back to our city, and I was ready to kiss Third Avenue, kiss the LIE, and especially the subway. And we may not have the best designed subway in the world, as we know, we who travel, but my goodness, it does, it does knit this city together, doesn't it? And I'm just, and I don't know, because we are such a private enterprise city, I don't have great uh, I don't have great faith in, in public initiatives, because in the end, look, what, look at Times Square. Now, Times Square, for 15, 20 years, the, the state tried to rebuild Times Square. They got nowhere. Disney bought the new Amsterdam Theater and redid it, announced they were redoing it. Within two, three years, the whole of Times Square was rebuilt. You may not like the way it's been rebuilt, but don't, it doesn't matter. 20 years from tomorrow, from tomorrow, they'll rebuild it again. So what difference does it make? I personally like what they did to Times Square because, like when I was a kid, Everybody now goes to Times Square for 30 years, only a very small sliver of the population. I was there, but only a very small sliver was there with me. Now everybody goes to Times Square, especially the tourists, who are the happiest people. You always know that it, it, there's a New Yorker in the crowd because they're the most miserable one going, trying to get through Times Square. And, and I'm, I'm fascinated by it, and it only took a few beach chairs to do that. And it didn't take a lot of money, did it? Now, it didn't take a lot of money. And I know, I know everybody has their pros and cons. It's New York, so everybody has an opinion about what's going on in Times Square. But for me, it was a remarkable 
change in the atmosphere. I love sitting in the middle of Broadway in a beach chair and looking up the vista of Broadway, which you could only do in a car, and it's wasted on people in cars. Because after all, they're all, you know, trying to get around the taxi and the bicycles and the truck. And I, and so, I don't know, I don't know in this city of public initiatives, I don't, I, I can't say, although I will say that, that Battery Park City was in its own way a, a, a public initiative, and people can criticize some of the architecture of the apartment buildings and say, oh, it's derivative. But as I mentioned before, I think that Battery Park City started us on the way to rethinking how we want to live in the city. Sure, it was built from the ground up, so it can't be that interesting. It's, it's all brand new, taken out of the package. But it got us thinking on how buildings and people can relate to the way we walk around the city and the way we inhabit the public spaces. And it may not be fashionable to praise Battery Park City, but I think that was in many ways, and the team who put it together, and the fellow who's on my right, it was part of that team, they did a lot to, to change. Look at the difference between the World Trade Center now gone and Battery Park City. I mean, we all, I, I'm sorry, you know, I, it was a horrible day that day, but the World Trade Center was an urban disaster. And I used to walk, I used to go to the World Trade Center a lot, I had to. Do you remember that public space? That was ridiculous. I mean, it was an absolute, uh, yes, you remember the, the ropes, the nautical ropes they used to put up? Because in the winter, those of you who never went there, the, it, the wind was so fierce and the ice coating on the plaza, so, so per, almost permanent during the winter, that you used to actually hang glide across that <laughs> plaza from one building to the next. And so they would put up ropes like they did on chips in the middle of a storm so that you wouldn't fall down and get swept into the, into the, into the Hudson River. <laughs> Battery Park City came along in the next generation, 10 years later, 15 years later, and it was so different. And I really think that changed the way a lot of people looked at design. So there is an example of a semi-public initiative changing the way we, we, we do things. But we are a private enterprise city. And I do have to remind people who have all these grandiose schemes about what New York is going to be. In the end, it's people like the Durst, who did the Bank of America building, and the Silversteins, Larry Silverstein, who's the main, who's the developer for the World Trade Center. Those are the people who build our cities for better or for worse. And, and uh, it, it, when they, it's interesting what Anthony said about, about the Durst building, which is the Bank of America building, uh, because they are one of the biggest developers in the city, and if they are that conscious about doing what they did for the Bank of America building, well, it just shows you. Uh, all that we're talking about is not just floating around in the air. The developers who build the city are beginning to take it to heart. But those are the people who are going to refashion New York. And uh, it, I, I mean, having lived in a city that was built by royalty, which is Paris, and is still continuing to be built by royalty, it has its upsides, yes but it does have its downsides. You come back to New York and you just feel that you never know when some stalactite or is a stalagmite is just going to pop up, you know, in, in, right next to you and, and the other thing is just going to crash down and something else replace it. it. It makes for the excitement of the city. And maybe it's an excitement we don't want, but we are here, aren't we? And we're, most of us are here voluntarily. I mean, it's not like we've been told we have to be. And I think that is part of, the, of, of New York. Thank you very much. Uh, we are here to, actually, we don't have time for any more questions. Today is uh, Oscar Niemeyer's birthday, and uh, Cooper Hewitt has uh, treated us with um, cupcakes outside. Uh, and we just found out today that today is National uh, Cupcake Day in, in the United <laughs> States. We really didn't know. Uh, so. I would like to invite you to go and get your cupcake, but before that, I would like to thank everyone on the panel, Mr. Cohn. Thank you very much, and please uh, go ahead and let's celebrate the birthday. <laughs>